Good day, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's edition of Teneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York City. Richard Haas is with me today. He's the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also the author or editor of 14 books, including his latest, the New York Times bestselling The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, which is out now from Penguin Press. A thematic departure from his previous works, it's a call, it's a call for change that puts the onus on all Americans to protect our democracy. Dr. Haas has served in both Democratic and Republican administrations, not a lot of people like that around these days, of course, including as Director of Policy Planning at the State Department, where he was Principal Advisor to Secretary Colin Powell. He was Special Assistant to President George H.W. Bush and Senior Director on the National Security Council for Near East and South Asian Affairs. And he was the United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland. And since 2003, he has served as the 13th president of the Council on Foreign Relations, where later this summer, after 20 years at the helm, he'll be stepping down to be succeeded by Michael Froman, best known as United States Trade Representative to President Obama. And Dr. Haas appears today thanks to the efforts of our mutual friend and my colleague, Kathy Lacey. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him back on this program. So, Richard, thank you and, uh, and welcome. So great to be with you. And just to clarify, it's not so much the efforts of Kathy Lacey. It was the bullying of Kathy Lacey that, that got me here. I just want to clarify that. that. That is proof that you know her as well as I do. So um, I, I've got to start with, and I'm sure, and my apologies to you, but this is for the benefit of the audience. I'm sure you've heard this question a thousand times on your book tour so far. But, but what prompts the president of the Council on Foreign Relations to write a book, you know, about um, uh, re-envisioning citizenship and uh, an American democracy. No, look, it's not obvious. And a couple of years ago, it wasn't in my wheelhouse in the sense of uh, things I would imagine, Kevin. Uh, it happened in part because every time I'd go out and talk about the world, people would say, what keeps me up at night? And increasingly, my answer was not the obvious ones about China, Russia, but was us. Uh, our own ability to come together to pass legislation to deal with our domestic challenges that I thought were increasingly tearing the society apart. Then, obviously, January 6th, which reached a new level or depth of, of division in this country. And increasingly, it became obvious to me that our ability to project an example of a democracy anyone in the world would want to emulate was fast fading. Uh, Reagan's uh, shining city on a hill was losing its, its luster. Uh, increasingly, allies around the world, as I was traveling, were saying, hey, what's going on there? Can we trust you anymore? And a lot of them were beginning to hedge against dependence on the United States. I can't prove it, but I think one of the reasons Vladimir Putin thought he could safely invade Ukraine and get away with it was that he discounted the will and ability of the United States to come together on behalf of uh, of uh, Ukraine. So for all these reasons, I basically said, hey, the, the, the growing national security issue is us. And if we can't come together here, uh, if we're, we're shed, if we really begin to come apart, we're not gonna have the bandwidth, the unity, you name it, the resources to deal with the, the rest of the world. So again, so for me, it's, it was a natural progression being a foreign policy national security guy to end up thinking about the, the, the domestic foundation of this country. So I can see why that is the thing that's keeping you, uh, keeping you up at night now. Do you think, I mean, how, how concerned are you in a sense of, you know, in your view, are we experiencing now a level of, a level of political division that actually represents a threat to American democracy as we have known and understood it? Sure. Good answer is yes, uh, for two reasons. One is the division makes it really hard to address challenges. And if we can't address challenges, I think the disaffection of Americans for their own government and for their country will grow. A poll came out the other day, Kevin, I don't know if you all saw it. It was a Wall Street Journal uh, poll done with this group at the University of Chicago. It showed that uh, levels of patriotism had plummeted uh, in this country, more and more negativity, uh, pessimism about the future, less interest in getting involved on behalf of community and, and uh, society. So if we can't, if the government can't be seen to deliver, I think uh, that's, that's the raw material of populism. Uh, so the danger in the United States, I think, is not that we become an authoritarian system, 
but ultimately we become an illiberal democracy. You know, and we're seeing it in places like Hungary. You're seeing uh, in Mexico, there's a move afoot in India and in Turkey. You're seeing elements of it in Israel. It's not unique to this country, but it matters more in this country, not simply because people like me are Americans, but we've had an outsized role uh, in the world. So if the United States cannot function well, I think it, uh, you know, I think it, it, it just matters more. And then also, look, you know, here we are a few days after the terrible shootings in Nashville. This country is awash in guns. You know, my point is simply that the potential for political violence is there, not simply because we're divided from one another, we're polarized, but the means are so distributed, they're so available in this country. And look, I spent three years as the U.S. envoy to Northern Ireland. We're just marking th this spring the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which ended the three decades of the Troubles there. What the Troubles in Northern Ireland show it doesn't take an awful lot of violence to essentially disrupt a society so workers can't get to work, they don't feel comfortable at work, consumers can't go to uh, stores. You know, business depends upon uh, the rule of law and stability and security. So it doesn't take a whole lot to disrupt it. So yeah, I do think the potential for, for political violence in this country cannot be, cannot be dismissed. So that, that leads me to my next question, which is, you know, it's remarkable throughout the book, you know, from the very opening pages to the last paragraph, and you and you and you return to it time and time again throughout the course of the book, um, and that is January sixth, and it really hangs over this book, and 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 so I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, um, that event, you know, and the uncertainty of the peaceful transfer of power, in the end. How big of an event is that? And how do you think history will and should regard it? Great question. Look, it was a big event because it was a stark, what, underscoring of how far we descended. I mean, the one of the defining norms of American democracy is that ride down Pennsylvania Avenue when the outgoing president and the incoming president ride together. And often it's been someone who lost to the the new the new person and when you know, the dismissal of that norm to me when when Donald Trump would not participate in the process and claim fraud with that with zero evidence as the Dominion lawsuit shows with with, with zero evidence backing it uh it up that showed to me how much you know, what I, again what I call the obligations of American democracy how how much they'd fallen by the uh the way so you know Donald Trump is a perfect example and by the way I run a nonpartisan institution I've worked for Democrats as well as Republicans but this this is something different this is someone who's putting person and party really person before country and that's not something that has been uh, a theme of American history. We've been blessed with people who have put country before party for the most part, or country before person. He represents something different, and the Republican Party has become a populist party. I joined, I became a Republican over 40 years ago when it was a conservative party. Conservatives believe in institutions. They believe in norms. This is something qualitatively, qualitatively uh, different. So yeah, January 6th to me represented how far things had gone. But to use a Reagan analogy, Ronald Reagan, and I talk about it in the book, called for not just patriotism, but informed patriotism. And my guess is, if you ask the people who were destroying and defacing the Capitol on January 6th, are they patriots? They would say, of course we're patriots. We're saving this country, a lot of them have claimed. And Reagan, if he were in part of the conversation, would have said, yeah, but you're not informed patriots. Uh, and I think that is what so what what we've done is we no longer teach the narrative of American uh, history or democracy to Americans. One of the reasons I'm such a promoter of civics education is why do we think this experiment is going to last if people don't understand the value of the experiment and what it requires of its citizens if it's going to to, to work. So yeah, I think January 6th is an important marker. What I don't know, and it, your question gets at, it's really interesting, will it be seen as a one-off, which is what we all hope and pray, that it's a, a shock to the body politic and we then claw our way back, or it's a harbinger? 
and then the January 6th is less of an exception, and it introduces an era of political violence. Obviously, we don't want to see the latter, but I can't sit here with confidence yet. We might have an interesting test. We're going to have a presidential election in what, 18 months? And we'll see. We'll see what happens uh, in terms of voting, the counting, the reaction to it all, how the, elect you know, the Electoral Count Act of 1877 has been reformed in very helpful ways, a really positive thing the lame duck Congress did late last year. So we'll see how all this, uh, how all this plays out, but we're gonna be tested. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is clear to me. And we've also just, again, got such a deeply polarized society on the question of what our rights should be. Look at the, sorry to go on so long, look at, look at the reaction to Nashville. You would think that we would, this would spur a degree of uh, limits on either who has access to guns or on the kinds of guns they have access to. Guess what? It's not. So there is something deeply wrong in American politics that we cannot address uh, these kinds of challenges. So yeah, I'm worried. So you know, in your in your comments, just uh, in response to my last question, you touched on a number uh, of the obligations you outline in the book, and I'll get to those in a few minutes, but you, you brought up one, um, which I wanted to, to, to dig a little deeper on here for, for a moment, and that was obligation number six, which is valuing norms. And I'm wondering if, you know, when you rewind the tape back to the early days of the, of the Trump administration, when there were those who were, were concerned about what his level of presidency was going to be, because he himself was not a particularly informed patriot um, as he um, as he entered office but you know our 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 institutions are governed by this combination of of rules and law and and norms and i think we were never quite sure what the exact balance of that was but as we went, got through that presidency i think we realized that the pre the office of the presidency and how it was wielded um and how power was wielded was far more dependent on the norms than a lot of us wound up being comfortable with at the end of the day. Do you think that that is, I mean, when, when you look at that balance between rules and norms, um, it's, it seems it's, it's pretty heavy on norms. Yeah, I'd probably, I probably, I agree with you hundred percent. I might use the terminology somewhat differently. You know, we like to tell ourselves all the times we're, we're a country of, of laws, not men or persons. Uh, and it turns out that's not exactly right. Yeah. And you go back to the Federalist Papers, you go back to the founders, and they wrote a lot about what they called virtue or character. And I think the lesson I take from American history and from the last few years is laws only take you so far. The law cannot anticipate everything. There's always gray area. There's always areas of judgment. There's always areas where of choice and in individual behavior. And that's where norms come in. That's where character uh, comes in. Because the problem is not that people do illegal things. We can deal with the illegal. We have a, a legal system that deals with it. We have police, we have courts. We know how to deal once people cross that line. The problem is how do you deal with behaviors just that come up to the line of legality, don't cross it, but are still truly, truly, truly unfortunate. Well, and we're gonna have a test in the Fox uh, Dominion lawsuit, whether that crossed the line, but even if it didn't cross the line, it's still to me outrageous what, uh, what was done there. Or Mr. Trump the other day, when he predicted death and destruction if he were to be indicted. Now he predicted death and destruction rather than called for death and destruction. That way he protected himself against the line of incitement. But this was a wink and a nod because all of his followers understood exactly what he was saying. So again, this is a gray area. It's not a legality probably, because again, it didn't trigger incitement, but it's clearly again, violates the norm that one ought not to be inciting political violence in this country with the, with the use of words. And that's where our, our legal system can't protect us from ourselves. And the only thing I know is either you depend on individuals to show character or virtue, that ain't working so well, or then the people come together and through the ballot box and other means, and they say, look, we're gonna penalize this kind of behavior. This is unacceptable. Instead, we're gonna reward other behavior. 
that we believe does embody character, virtue, whatever you, norms, whatever you want to call it. So at the end of the day, it's in a funny sort of way, it's up to us. And that ain't great because a lot of us aren't getting informed. Either we don't bother or we're, we're tuning into outlets that are peddling misinformation or we don't get involved. I mean, look at the recent midterms. Well over half of the eligible voters didn't vote, even though it was a critical event in American political history. So we've got real issues with Americans getting informed and then getting involved. So um, I want to digress for just a minute and go go outside the U.S. and, and we're going to talk more about Russia and, and, and China uh, later. But you know, you talk in in chapter two of the book about this process, and you just referenced it a minute, which is why I'm bringing it up now. Um, you know, that we go through this process of competing and then voting on those on those who are competing for our votes. We count those votes, and then we go through the peaceful transfer of uh, of power, whether you're talking about the White House or the, the town dog catcher. Um, and that, and you make the point that this doesn't happen in places like Russia or or China. Um, but on that point, you know. Did it look to you, just with regards to China, because we've gone through such an extraordinary moment here with the leadership, um, uh, the leadership meetings of the last six months in, in China. You know, since, since Deng Xiaoping had come along, did you think that China had sort of threaded the needle as far as authoritarian states were concerned? That here you have this authoritarian power, the Chinese Communist Party, and yet, unlike, you know, these sort of uh, cult of personality, single people like Putin, as an example, they had this built-in system of renewal. Every 10 years, a new president would come along, um, and you had this kind of consensual system, and it looked like um, they had maybe figured that out. Um, and then, of course, Xi Jinping comes along and takes the table um, at the People's Cong Party Congress and, uh, and is ba basically potentially president for life. The short answer is, yeah, I got it somewhat wrong. I think you know, Deng Xiaoping was a reformer. And to use the language of my book, every society is a balance between rights and obligations. And under, under Deng Xiaoping, the balance of obligations to the states versus rights of the individual moved ever so slightly in the direction of rights of the individual. I don't want to exaggerate it. The state was still paramount. The party was still paramount. But if you look at the political sphere, a little bit of space opened up, economic sphere, a little bit more private activity and the rest. Xi Jinping has come in and he has dialed that back and then some. He's the strongest Chinese leader since, since Mao. And essentially now China is pretty much a society with few if any rights and all obligations uh, to, the, uh, to the state, to the uh, part. And I think most observers were slow to predict it or even see it, but it's, it's obvious now. And, and the fact that he's going to be in office, I presume, for five or 10 more years or who knows how long, he, that will be institutionalized, though history suggests maybe not. Just as the, you know, we, Deng Xiaoping followed after several others by Xi Jinping, my guess is at some point, a new Chinese leader will come along. I don't know if it's in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and we'll move the pendulum a little bit back. I would predict, Kevin, that the day will come when we will see people in Tiananmen Square carrying signs or photographs of Deng Xiaoping saying that uh, we've gone too far and there's a cult of personality or it's you know, we'll see how it looks and we'll see how it plays out. I also think, by the way, the same thing will happen in Russia, that the day yeah. will come when you will have an anti-Putin movement and people will say, we're tired of being a pariah, we're tired of these, the isolation economically, politically, uh, Russia needs to rejoin Europe. And I think may not be Putin's immediate successor, maybe it's the successor to his successor, but I think that day will come whenever you have these kinds of extremes. Uh, they bring with them such contradictions and such costs that I think it's inevitable that sooner or later, I'm just not, I'm not smart enough to put a date on it, but I think sooner or later the pendulum in these societies will, uh, will swing. The problem is if that's a medium term to long term outcome, we've got to get to that point. And the near term and the medium term until then can be quite costly for the people in those societies and for the rest of us.
Yeah, yeah. So sorry, I I digressed there for a minute, but I want to come back to the to the book. And you know, you made a point a few minutes ago that you know democracy, uh, d democratic black backsliding has really been a hallmark of and global trend of the 21st century. Uh, we may be seeing it play out in real time, as you pointed out in Israel right now. Uh, the U.S. has clearly not been immune to it. But, you know, there have always been demagogues and there have always been would be, you know, authoritarians. Um, and 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 but around politics, you know, you 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 make the point in the book that there is a dangerous moment is when the vulnerabilities in that state, you know, to, or to that system kind of invite these these guys in. And so I'm wondering why you think now is that moment, particularly in the United States. Yeah, I ask a lot. I ask myself the same question. I write about it a little bit, but you're seeing it in other countries as well. Part of it we've touched on, I think, particularly if you're younger, just say you're under 40. So you've maybe been a, had a degree of political awareness for 20 odd years. Well, think of these 20 odd years. You know, 9 11, the 2007 eight financial crisis, two costly, expensive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a pandemic, middle age, uh, middle class wage stagnation, growing inequality, uh, more recently, inflation, banking uh, crises. Not a hell of a lot to celebrate. And you see it in the polls. You see these polls coming out that show real pessimism about prospects, real pessimism that my lot is going to be better than my parents. So I think some of it is simply situational. It's, it's one of the reasons, again, that, and that's something, by the way, you see throughout history, democracies are vulnerable to the ability or inability of democratic governments to deliver. And when people get frustrated with government and what it's, what it's promoting or doing, they then get open to alternatives. You know, the most extreme case historically is Germany, say, in the 20s and 30s, uh, with runaway inflation and the rest. But people, you know, extreme times bring about extreme politics. And if people get worried or even desperate, then they jet it, they're prepared to jettison things if they think that somehow what comes next. We've seen versions of that in Latin America. More, more reasons. I think that's part of it, that it's just been a bad run. I think there's issues in this country about you know, something's uniquely American, how we fund our politics has strengthened the, uh, the uh, extremes. I think the, we live in an era of narrow casting, uh, whether it's cable, whether it's social media, radio, and people increasingly uh, gravitate towards narrow outlets that reinforce their prejudices or, or worldviews. I think as a country, we've become much more separate. We all live in our, you know, our separate geographies. We go to our separate religious institutions, uh, you know, different levels of educational. Bottom line is, you know, we don't have national service in any form. We have fewer and fewer common experiences as citizens. We don't know much about our own country. Again, one of the reasons I'm so big on things like civics is uh, I think we've got to teach our narrative. We've got to explain to Americans why this system of ours, this experiment is actually worth keeping, even though it's been a rough patch right now, but we don't do that. So I think there's any number of reasons uh, about why we are uh, where we are. And as you say, it's not unique to the United States. I think we've got some peculiarly American twists on it. And again, I think it counts for more here. I don't, I don't much like a liberalism in Israel or in uh, Mexico or India or Turkey but they don't have the same footprint in the world that we do. So I think it's more consequential when it happens here. Sort of ironic, and I think you point this out in the book as well, that, um, that uh, you know, an immigrant who is trying to become a U.S. citizen is, is obligated to learn more about this stuff than, uh, than those of us who are, who are born with the privilege of, uh, of citizenship here. So um, I, I want to turn to some of the obligations themselves. Um, we don't have time to go through, through all of them. But I think it, it is worth covering some of them in, in a little bit more detail. And I just want to reiterate to the audience, I think, you know, this is a, this is a good book because it's very, it, it's actually quite succinct and it elegantly lays out, you know, how we got here um, together, quite frankly. Um, and as I read the book and I looked at some of these obligations um, as, they're, as they're laid out, uh, on the one hand, they sound quite obvious. It's, um, the problem is it's alarming um, how necessary it is to to be reminded of them 
Um, and, you know, upon a little bit of examination, which Richard goes through in each of them, you know, how e easy it is for the, um, uh, for the country to fall off the, off the wagon in a sense. So um, I want to talk about the very first obligation in there because, it, you know, it's relevant to a program like this, which is, you know, be informed, as you, um, as you see. We touched on this, you know, a little bit already, but I'm reminded of the quote from um, Orwell's 1984. You know, he says, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And we're seeing that clearly play out in the way that Putin is leading his people uh, into, uh, into this war, as an example. Um, but, you know, when you and I were growing up, the decision was, are you going to watch NBC, CBS, or ABC at 630? Um, and that was kind of it, you know. Um, but now, as you point out, it's completely atomized. We find our tribe, um, and, that's kind of, and that's kind of it. Um, but the be informed part is really, really tough right now. Yeah, it's, it's ironic because there's more information, more readily available than in any other time in human history. You know, just go onto the Google machine or what have you. And again, there's a zillion cable, radio, you know, satellite radio, there's social media. And the problem is uh, most of these lack any gatekeeping, any quality uh, control, any, any editing, uh, any fact checking. So we, what it turns out is we have almost unfettered access to misinformation uh, and, or information that only tells a small part of reality. So even if it's narrowly accurate, it's in the large inaccurate because it's so unrepresentative. So we, we've got that problem. We've got to teach information literacy in our schools. Uh, New Jersey just recently signed a law, Governor Murphy, that is going to do that. It's going to teach it in, in, in schools. I, I'd love to see it done in all 50 states. Finland does it uh, in its schools overseas. And the whole idea is to help young people say, OK, how do I know a fact when I see one? What makes a fact a fact? How do, what are my rules for navigating this information landscape? For example, multi-sourcing. I mean, if you had uh, some symptoms that were serious, you wouldn't just go to one doctor, you'd get a second opinion. Okay, maybe we need to get second opinions when it comes to things about politics. What's the difference between a fact and an opinion uh, or a prediction uh, how do, or, or prescription? How do we know the, the differences and so forth? So I think we've got we've to teach that. I think, you know, also we've got to tell people again where to go for trusted information. How do you know it's trusted? I'd love people also to get some background again, why I'm so big on civics. I think it's you know, here in the United States, we've got, I don't know, 4,000 plus or minus colleges and universities. Why is it possible to graduate from more than 95% of them without being required to take a course in, Amer in American citizenship or civics? That to me is, is, is crazy. Uh, you know, we wouldn't let people graduate from, from a college with it being unable to read or unable to deal with computers in a basic way. Why are we producing people who are illiterate when it comes to being citizens? I just think it's, it's just irresponsible. Uh, and, we, and we can and should uh, do, something, do something about it. But, you know, Jefferson was the one who said that democracy rests on a foundation of informed citizenry. And we are not doing it. So you're, you're, you're touching also on, on obligation number nine, which is, you know, support the teaching um, of, of civics. But on this whole point that you've just made, I mean, unfortunately, there are, there are, some, there are some people who, you know, for whom an uneducated electorate um, actually works, right? In other words, if, if the electorate doesn't understand the, 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 the institutions, the basic separations of power, and then the details behind all of that, um, then, you know, you can, you know, you can, you can project that this is the way I, we ought to do things without, without, you know, any with sort of unfettered in a sort of an unfettered fashion, right? Um, nobody will push back if they are on under informed in a sense. Well, look, this is a representative democracy for the most part. So we elect, people who either exercise authority directly or they appoint those who who do. So part of the checks and balances, as you say, is being informed. And we can observe what they do and if need be, vote them, vote them out of uh, office if we don't like what we're doing. Needless to say, those who are in office want to stay there. 
so they don't necessarily, uh, you know, and they're pursuing their agendas or they're pursuing policies that will tend to keep them in office because powerful groups in the population su support them. I can't stop that. Uh, that to me is the nature of, of politics. It's, nat it's human nature. All I can then hope is that more Americans or in any democracy, more individuals get involved, informed and then involved uh, who, and then we'll do so in a way that will penalize certain behaviors and reward uh, reward others. It, it almost it's almost that that simple. I assume, if you will, people with power mostly want to stay in power at almost any cost. It's not virtuous. It's just reality. And I want to simply deny them that that opportunity, shall we say? But the only way I know of doing it is through citizen involvement. So your your eighth obligation is to to respect government service. Now clearly, um, you know uh, there's a there there has been a move to revile those who are um, in government service, whether they be elected or or unelected. We use the pejorative term the deep state, um, and you know, but and but the reality of it is, is some 25, 27 million Americans are involved in government service, either at national level, all the way down to local. In other words, they are us, they are our next door neighbors, um, and 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 the like. Um, and you know, even during the Trump administration, which you know went out of its way to revile the deep state, we saw time and time again members of that administration who were dedicated public servants, who were very very qualified people. I think of Fiona Hill sitting up. Uh, uh, in front of um, Congress testifying as an example, but but um, I want to address this question from the other from another perspective. How damaging it is to an individual to try to hold public office today. You're going to be raked across the coals. Your opposition is not going to respectfully disagree with you. They're going to hate you. They're going to uncover everything you and your family have ever done. Is it is it really preventing the A team? Let's call it. From wanting to go to Washington anymore, um, and that we are left with kind of much more narcissistic or really, really deeply ideological people, um, as opposed to you know this kind of noble sense of public service. It seems to be having that effect, with uh, fewer and fewer exceptions. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree. You know, when I first went to Washington, I'm a dinosaur, but I first worked in Washington in the '70s. I worked first on the Hill with Congress, I was a staffer, and then I worked at the Pentagon. But I remember looking around the Senate, and Fulbright was still the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I looked at the people arrayed uh, around them, including, by the way, at the end of the table, a young Joe Biden, a young uh, senator from, uh, from, but you had Javits from New York and Symington and, and so forth. You had, you know, pretty impressive, pretty impressive people. And I look around the table now, and shall we say, I don't have exactly the same sense of uh, of awe. Look, you give up a lot now in public. You, you privacy. You obviously pay a financial price for it, so long as you are, you know. And the physical threats now uh, that a lot of you, know, you see it at judges and uh, and and others. So yeah, there's a coarsening of America, and, and I. It's, it's obviously subjective, but my guess is the best and the brightest are less attracted to this. Uh, I see it in my own field. When I came of age again, then you know, public policy issues were really exciting. And the best and the brightest, in many cases, gravitated towards them. Now I think the best and the brightest uh, gravitate either towards financial engineering or the world of technology. Not putting down either of those things. Uh, both are you know, rewarding and important, make contributions. But I just wish a few more really, really talented people were heading this way. One thing, by the way, I'm hoping companies think about what, what they can do for democracy. Just like universities give people leaves of absence to go in, like uh, or you know, institutions like mine, the Council on Foreign Relations, we probably over, I don't know, 15 to 20 people, fellows here, have left to go into this administration for uh, a couple of years. You know, more than a few will come back here. I would love to see businesses adopt a more flexible policy. So just like you create the ability, say, to join the military reserves, and it's understood that you know people every so often will have won't be available to go to the office. They have to fulfill their commitment. I would love for American businesses to make it more possible 
for their most talented employees to go into government for a while, to give a couple of years of uh, service or even to every, you know, to serve on this or that advisory body. I think it would, I think it would be great because we've got to, we've got to get talent in government because uh, it affects so much our lives so fundamentally. You know, it isn't, you were mentioning on the, the anti-government thing, forgetting that so many of us are in government. You know, I laugh at times. People rail against government, but then they, they talk about this about Social Security or this about the fire department or the police department and the rest. People, you know, we depend on government. That's, again, it's the basis, law and order, physical security, the functioning of the economy and so forth. All of these only happen because of government. So we should want the best and the brightest to, to, to be going into these positions. Yeah, there's a real cognitive dissonance there. Um, you know, uh, you brought up companies. Um, uh, so it, it leads me to this question. You know, your, your obligations uh, as laid out in this book, you know, are, are for us as individuals, as citizens, as voters. But I do wonder, considering that the corporation is the single most important economic actor in our society. Do, do companies have obligations um, in, in your Absolutely. Yeah, look, and it's interesting. Thanks for asking. And look, you know, companies, corporations were seen as citizens in terms of free speech. And that's, so they, they, they have certain rights in American democracy, which is, you know, I respect. But yeah, but with rights, my whole argument of the book is with rights come obligations. Citizenship is a coin. One side is rights, one side is obligations, what we owe one another and what we owe this, the, the country and the government. So sure, I would say corporations, one right, I mean, one obligation, sorry, is to make it easy for people to vote. So many corporations are doing it, but you know, right now in the United States, election day tends to be, uh, it's Tuesday, that's a work day for most places. Well, corporations ought to figure out a way to make it easy for their employees to go off and either vote or work at the polls and so forth. So political participation ought to be something that uh, employers make uh, possible. But then I would say that I already talked about the idea of making it possible for people to serve in government. Let me suggest one or two other things. And you know, this is more controversial, but there you have it. You asked me to speak here today. Uh, I don't think corporations ought to be writing checks to political candidates who are election deniers, who are democracy underminers. Think about it. Every corporation on this call they depend upon law and order for their workers to get to work safely, for their customers or consumers to be able to get to outlets or stores to, to do it. They don't want to see the weaponization of the Justice Department or the IRS against them simply because if they contribute money to the, the other political party, they don't want the powers of government trained on them. They want accountable, responsible, transparent uh, government. So why would they contribute money to people who don't believe in democracy or would bring, why do they advertise on outlets that are giving voice to individuals who want to weaken American democracy? So I'm just asking corporations not only to do the right thing, if you will, in nor normatively, but I think to do the self-interested thing. They ought to be investing and pr protecting American democracy. Turns out it's good for business. So I think I think American business needs to do much more to promote and protect American democracy. OK, so the clock is ticking here. Um, we could go through a number of the other obligations. But while I've got you, I have to uh, I can't help myself. We've got to talk a little bit about what's going on um, in, in the world today. So I want to pivot here for a second to a couple of a uh, couple of issues. So let's start. Let's start with the Russia Ukraine war. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of interested here, you know, well, let's step back for one second, because some of the potential would-be um, uh, competitors for the presidency um, are arguing that the outcome of this war is not necessarily related to the national interests of the United States. Um, and I'd like for you to explain why it is um, in the national security interests of the United States. The beginning of that answer is that the United States in almost every way is affected by what goes on in the world. You know, we, these oceans that surround the United States are not. Uh, and in the global world, what happens elsewhere, one way or another, finds its way here. And to use the old, my, uh, my favorite line, the world is not Las Vegas. What happens there doesn't stay there. We see it with climate change. 
over a million Americans lost their lives because of a pandemic that one way or another broke out in, uh, in uh, Wuhan. Uh, so we see how the world matters. Now, the world doesn't operate by a whole lot of rules. To the extent there's any rule, it's the idea that countries ought not to invade other countries and acquire territory by force. If you remember 30 odd years ago at the outset of the post-Cold War period, the first crisis was Saddam Hussein and Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And the United States brought the world together to resist it. The principal reason we did so, and I was heavily involved at the time, I was the Middle East advisor at the time to the president, was because we wanted a world in the aftermath of the Cold War, well, negative, we did not want a world to evolve in which aggression would become commonplace. So we believed it was necessary to show that aggression across borders would not and could not uh, succeed lest it become a precedent. So here we are 30 years later, the pre that, that, that message of 30 years ago has worn thin. A lot of people have forgotten it or don't, don't value it. So I think this really matters. And it matters in terms of you know, what else Mr. Putin could do in Europe. It matters for what China might do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or elsewhere in Asia. It matters maybe what a North Korea would do, what an Iran would do. And the United States will not do well, our interests or our values or, or much of anything, our prosperity in a world in which conflict becomes uh, more, more, more common. So yeah, I do think it's uh, the vital national interest of the United States to demonstrate that aggression can't succeed. Now, that said, and this is where it gets complicated, how you translate that into policy doesn't mean necessarily that the only way to make good on what I just said is for Ukraine to have the ability to recover all of its territory in the next year through military force. I would say not necessarily. And then, you know, we can have a, a much longer conversation about what, what what's the range of responsible policy uh, Choices given both what's desirable, what's doable, what are the trade-offs, and that's you know that's that's why what I why I do what I do for a business, and I think about that, and I'll be writing about that for our magazine Foreign Affairs shortly, and and so forth. But as a first order policy, we have a major stake that Russian that Russia fails in its attempt, which was not simply to acquire a chunk of Ukrainian territory. Russia sought to eliminate Ukraine as an independent sovereign actor with ties to the West uh, and that was not controlled by Moscow. Oh, after more than a year, Putin has failed at that. We have to make sure he never succeeds at that. So there was a, there was a fantastic panel at the council um, a couple of weeks ago um, that was talking about the uh, prospects for, for, for the war. And, you know, here we are, we are on the eve of, um, uh, of what will likely be the sort of the spring offensive by the uh, by the Ukrainians, newly bolstered by uh, more advanced weaponry from from the West, both offensive and defensive in, in in capability. But the point of that panel was essentially, if Ukraine is resourced militarily, economically, politically, every single time they have been resourced, they have prevailed on the battlefield against um, a, a, against the incompetent Russian military, and and so the 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 the, the, the takeaway from that was what the West wants, and in effect, what the United States wants, um, is ultimately going to be the determinant of this, uh, of this war. And so the question I have is, you know, what is the, I mean, it, it seems to me that Biden administration has done a lot, and they've done an extraordinary amount, but they haven't truly defined what the outcome that they want is. Have they? Do they have an outcome that they want? Are they waiting to see how well Ukrainians do in this uh, in this offensive, and do they reclaim some territory? Or what What do you think we want, and is it being sold to the American people and beyond? Kevin, you have packed a lot into that question. Uh, it is about out and again about, and, and will appear in not too distant future in our in our magazine. Let me just react to two things that you said. One is a lot of the conversation is about, is advocating for greater American and European military support of Ukraine. Give them advanced aircraft, give them advanced tanks, what have you. And the assumption is, if we do, were to do that, that Ukraine would prevail on the battlefield. Uh, 
let me just sort of say I am unpersuaded of that assumption. Okay. I think we ought to do it, uh, but I'm not that the assumption's right. And lots of reasons going into it about what Russia is able to bring in terms of aircraft, potential Chinese help if Russia ever got into a bad position. I am skeptical of that. I'm happy. I think we should test it. I'd love to be proven wrong. Good news is I'm wrong all the time. But I am skeptical that if only the United States and Europe want to give Ukraine some more capable military uh, items, that that would be transformative on the uh, battle. If it, is, if it is, then that certain dynamic slow for them. At the end of the day, diplomacy will reflect the battlefield. But if I'm right, and it's not transformative, then we have to think what then, which gets to your second question. This entire war has been, how would I put it? It's been carried out with a certain opaqueness or imprecision about our definition of victory. What constitutes a success? So I'd say a minimal, const a minimal definition of success is Ukraine continues to exist as a viable sovereign country. And I think you know, right now it's sitting on roughly 80% of its territory uh, that it had in 1991 when it became uh, independent. It's sitting on well upwards of 95% of the territory that it had before the Russian invasion just over uh, a year ago. So on one level, you could say it's been pretty successful. Ukraine, Ukraine uh, continues to exist in a meaningful, viable way, even though it's been a terrible cost economically, human life, refugees, what have you. I think going forward, there has not been a real conversation in this country about what our war aim should be. And I think we're coming up on it because it, it has all sorts of implications for what do we, you know, how long do we go on providing levels of economic and military support? Should Ukraine be pressured to or compromise? What's realistic? What's achievable militarily? So I think we have danced around this, and I don't think this dance can go on forever. So my guess is, if I were in the predictions game, which is always dangerous, as Yogi Berra pointed out, uh, I would think at the end of, you know, somewhere next fall, this coming fall, after, if you will, a second fighting season, as we head into the next winter, depending upon where things are in the battlefield, Imagine they're sort of where they are now. We've given Ukraine a lot more high quality stuff, and my prediction is right. It hasn't fundamentally changed the military outcome. But what then? Do we say we're going to do this for five more years within the belief that that would militarily transform the situation? Are we able to do it, given the lack of a uh, military industrial base in this country, a manufacturer? To, uh, is it wise to do it, given our commitments to Asia, our concerns about what Iran may be up to in the Middle East? Are we politically willing to do it, given you know, debt conversations, I can, budgetary conversations, political considerations? So my guess is we're maybe six months away from a serious conversation in this country about where do we go from, from here. We know our minimal aims, uh, and I think there's a consensus there. I don't think there's a consensus on, if you will, the plus up, the, the maximal aims. What is, uh, what, what, what might be satisfactory, even if it's not perfect? And I think that's a debate and a conversation to, to come. And if my, I get my own sense is it's probably for this fall. Okay, I want to pivot to uh, to China here, um, which uh, uh, our audience knows we devote a lot of time on this program too. Um, and I have two questions for you. <clears throat> Obviously, we're at a very, very low point in um, in U.S. relations with with China. Uh, I guess the question is sort of: Are we barreling down a path that we don't really have to? And are you concerned if that's the case? Are you concerned as we head toward the 2024 election season that you know this seeming bipartisan hawkishness on 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 China uh, is going to is going to kind of go off the rails in a sense that, that both sides will then have to out hawk the other to prove that the other is too soft on China uh, in a sense and that could lead us into into dangerous new territory so that's question one the question two is does China have a perspective though that we ought to be listening to um, do they have some points that are worth um, considering or is it as binary as um, a lot of our elected officials would like to make it out to be 
Yeah, on the former, I do worry about this uh, almost competition between the two parties as to who can be tougher or harder on China. You know, we always yearn or call for bipartisanship as though it's a panacea. Maybe not so much. We had bipartisanship on Afghanistan. I did not think that was a uh, glorious moment in American statecraft. We have bipartisanship on trade, and the result is we have no trade policy. We have bipartisanship on China, and U.S.-Chinese relations have reached a depth that they really have not been in in the modern era since the modern relationship was uh, just that's enough to make you question the uh, desirability and value of bipartisanship, uh, just saying. Uh, indeed, I'm hard-pressed to think of the difference if you, you, know, you could, between the, the Trump and the Biden policies on China. Uh, pretty hard. And by the way, so are the Chinese. I had a really interesting meeting a few days ago with this senior Chinese individual who said to me, uh, what confidence could you give me if we ever did anything you want that there's anything in it for us. And I think increasingly China has dismissed it. And he said, it's all, and it's only going to get worse in the run up to November 24. And uh, indeed, one of the reasons I think that China might be tempted at some point to do more to help Russia if need be, is they figure there's no not much upside if they don't. And they've already been pretty penalized as things stand. So there can't be that much more downside. Uh, they've kind of written us off. And just saying now, I think one or if not the principal reason we are where we are, though, is because of Chinese policy, what we talked about a few minutes ago. I think Xi Jinping's China is a very different one in terms of uh, domestic politics, the role of the state in the economy, and a much more assertive Chinese uh, foreign policy. There were so many expectations built into the U.S.-Chinese relationship 20 years ago that if we only integrated China into the world, it would become more open. Uh, more market oriented, more moderate, and none of that has come to pass. So I think what we're now seeing is the almost the, the disillusionment kicking in. Uh, and that, you know, we are where we are, where we, uh, we are there. Uh, I think we've made some mistakes. I think, for example, we made a mistake by not going ahead with the Secretary of State's trip during the balloon affair. Last I checked, you have diplomacy when there are problems. So if anything, you, know, you should have gotten on an airplane and just go. There's a chance, first chance in a half dozen years for the Secretary of State to meet with Xi Jinping. I thought that was just a major tactical error. Prove it, but my guess is, well, reason we didn't go ahead on the trip was people were worried that they would be accused of, you know, why are you why are you flying off to meet with these guys when they're putting balloons over the United States? My reaction was, what better time to meet with them than when they're putting balloons over the United States and we're shooting them down? That's why, you know, that's why God invented diplomats. Uh, but I think, again, we've got a backdrop where it's, it's very hard to, uh, to uh, do things. But yeah, I think we ought to be talking to the Chinese all the time. I don't think diplomacy is a favor. I think probably the emphasis should be on what we avoid rather than what we create. So I would spend a lot of time on two issues. One would be Taiwan, setting some guardrails, whatever you want to call it. And second of all would be on Ukraine, trying to put certain limits on what China would do for for Russia. And then I'd be open to conversations where we might accomplish something. Let me just give you one example. We've got a, not just, you know, we've got a banking crisis going on. Is there something the two largest economies in the world could do in terms of coming up with new global arrangements, I don't know, on, on liquidity or capital requirements for financial institutions? What have you? They could sit down and, so I think, we ought to be looking for particular pockets. Maybe there's something on climate. You know, I, I've given up getting China to be helpful on North Korea. Uh, you know, we can go around the world, but I would think there may be some global issues where maybe we could do some limited cooperation. I think that there should be much more regular diplomacy, so at least we have a better reading of one another, so we can perhaps reduce the chances of having a real crisis rather than just a deterioration of uh, of our uh, of relations, you know, look, it's it's not wildly ambitious what I just talked about, but sometimes in this business, what you can avoid becomes uh, ambitious enough as opposed to what you can create. Yeah, you know, um, 
we only have a couple minutes left, so I, I want to close by by asking you, you know, as you as you wind down your tenure um, there at the, I want to ask you about the Council on Foreign Relations itself. I think you know many people in this country, many in our audience, are are aware of it. Perhaps mostly uh, via the flagship publication, Foreign Affairs. Obviously, they're probably familiar with a high profile membership of the um, uh, of the council, but. You know, as you get ready to leave, and you've you've done a lot over the last twenty years, particularly involving as well corporate membership as well. You know, talk about the essential role that this institution plays in the national and international conversation, and how it fits into what all we've been talking about today. Well, actually, it fits into a lot. Like the council is a hundred years old; it's an important legacy institution. The idea is to put out authoritative information analysis make serious recommendations to inform raise the quality of the the policy debate I, I see us as a resource and you know we're nonpartisan we're independent of government just you know speaking truth to, to power and to citizens in this country and around the uh or around the world simply because the world matters foreign policy matters and we can help people make i think uh informed judgments and then uh, choices and, and you know, we've always done it sometimes better than other times uh, for what you might call people inside the foreign policy conversation the executive branch the Congress you know the New York Times or Wall Street Journal uh, the fortune 100 uh, and some members of the council for membership organization uh, uh, readers of foreign affairs the big change I try to make over the last 20 years was in addition to doing all of that and hopefully you know, doing it better, tweaking the agenda and so forth, uh, is also to reach people who are not part of the traditional conversation. Uh, and we've become in some ways the largest educator in the world about the world. We have an entire curriculum online, we're in schools, high schools and colleges in all 50 states and well over 100 countries around the world. We've got two websites, uh, CFR.org and foreignaffairs.com. The whole, we're doing teacher training. Uh, we are, we're, we're working with iCivics, even in middle schools, as well as high schools and colleges, the stuff we do. We put out explainers on every issue. I mean, the debt ceiling say, okay, well, what does it mean to have a vote on the debt ceiling? What are the issues? What are the, what are the consequences of this way or that? So we've had our traditional role of being part, kind of at the vanguard of what you might call the elite conversation. And what I've tried to do is add to that, that we would become an educator in the largest sense of the uh, world, bringing foreign policy to a much larger swath of this society and other societies, what we call trying to make people uh, globally literate, not in the sense of being able to read, but able to understand the world and foreign policy choices. And I think, I think that's the big innovation in what we've done uh, on my watch. And a tangible example of that, my teenage son is a uh, an active participant in Model UN, and he is a big user of the um, uh, of those resources. Uh, so it should be gratifying to you. Um, yeah, Richard, yes, uh, my, my, my daughter, when she used to do debate in college, she said, she said it's really frustrating. You're in danger of becoming a rock star with the Model UN and the debate crowd because people are using your uh, the stuff from the uh, the council. So uh, I, I figured. Success, Richard. <laughs> Richard Haas has been my guest today. His essential new book is the Bill, uh, the Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. You know, as he writes in this book, um, we get the government and the country we deserve. Getting the one that we need, however, uh, is up to us. Um, for many members of the Council on Foreign Relations, especially the really youthful ones like myself, you're the only president uh, you've known. So I want to thank you for your for your leadership of an organization that I'm proud to belong to uh, and that I learn from every day. Um, so thank you for your thoughts today uh, and for joining us. Thank all of you for joining us. We'll be back with another edition of Taneo Insights. And until then, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.